Hello everyone. Today we start a new part of the course, namely we will talk about more advanced topics. And the first uh, topic that we'll discuss is about deep generative modeling and latent variable models specifically. So let's start with an introduction. Of course, the first question uh, is whether generative modeling uh, is even important or useful for us. So to understand that, let, let us discuss a very simple uh, problem. So we learn a neural network to classify images. So far, you've heard that actually this is uh, doable with uh, deep learning. Even more, this gives us very good results. So let's say that we have a panda bear and we have very well-trained uh, neural network and the neural network gives us really high probability. So the softmax uh, activation gives us almost like certainty that this is a panda bear. But if we add a little bit of noise, for instance, some Gaussian noise or whatever, then uh, what, uh, what we notice in practice is that uh, a neural network can completely go crazy and can give you totally wrong um, classification label, all right? So in this case, for instance, a neural network after adding this noise gives us that with high uh, certainty, this is a dog, right? So what does it mean? It means that there is no semantic understanding of images. If we, as human beings, uh, we look at these images and if we add a little bit of noise, basically this image is still the same and we can easily see what is in this uh, image. However, a neural network uh, fails. So now there is a question, right? So is it enough to train a discriminative model, a neural network, a classifier, a neural network that classifies, uh, for instance, images? Well, probably this is not enough. Moreover, we need some kind of notion of uh, uncertainty. What does it mean? It means that maybe we should balance, we should wait a little bit uh, in probabilistic sense, uh, what, how probable or how likely is this uh, object, the given object, okay? And also, we definitely need to understand the reality and this is somehow an additional constraint that we should maybe impose on our uh, models. How to do that? Well, this is of course a very difficult question, but at least this is, uh, these are some kind of points that can uh, help us to, to build uh, better models. And uh, today we will claim that actually generative modeling can help us with, with uh, achieving these points, right? And also to understand further what uh, we mean by discriminative generative models uh, and what we need for generative models. So let us consider uh, a simple uh, data set with uh, two labels, uh, two of my favorite uh, animals, so horses and cats. And uh, as you can see that they are somehow distributed in the data space. And uh, let us assume that first we uh, train a discriminative model. Uh, so we get uh, some uh, decision boundary, right? So as you can see, so this is uh, on the left more or less is there are horses and on the right there are cats. And this is just the, the conditional distribution. So this is, let's say a neural network. This is parameterized by a neural network. And now we can uh, also say that, well, we can uh, model joint distribution, right? So we, we, we have not only a probability for uh, classifying for labels, but we have also probability distribution for uh, objects, for images. So we can say how probable is that given image occurs, right? So this is the joint distribution. Um, and let us assume now that we have a new data point. We have our panda bear totally out of the blue. Let's say that it lies in, in this uh, part of the data space, all right? So now the question is how these two models uh, behave, right? Because 
uh, this is this is uh, this is something like new point. So how these two models uh, behave? It turns out that actually, if we if we have this data point that lies you know further from the, the decision boundary, right? So further from cats and more on this let's say horse side, uh, this model can give us the following uh, results. So it can tell us that this is with high probability this is a horse, right? Because this is this it lies really uh, on the the left side on the side of horses. So in other words, this is highly probable decision. However, if we take a look at the, the joint distribution, uh, this will give us something different because from one side, this P of Y given X, the conditional distribution can still tell us that, yeah, this is with high probability a horse. But on the other hand, this distribution over images, this P of X can tell us that, wait a moment, I have never seen such object before and it lies in this part of the data space uh, that I have never observed anything in the past, right? So in other words, it will tell us that this is an object with very low probability. I, I don't know what is that actually, right? And this is exactly what we want to achieve. Then in the end, when we multiply these two distributions, probably we will have something like very uncertain decision, all right? So, so this is exactly what we want to, to get. We want to get some kind of understanding of data, all right? And the simplest uh, way of achieving understanding of data is by saying whether this object was observed in the past or not, all right? So this is precisely what we are focusing uh, today on this distribution P of uh, X. So let's say that we, we are, I hope, more than less, but more or less we are convinced that's right. Generative modeling is good and uh, generative models are uh, treated as models that we can generate new data points, but very often also, especially statisticians uh, or let's say the statistical machine learning people, they would say that, well, the generative model is a model that uh, gives us opportunity to model everything about uh, reality. And then in a, uh, by, by factorizing the distribution, we can you know, think of a generative process. So this is what we had uh, on previous slides. And now, of course, this next question is, if we are, let's say, motivated that this is, this is a good direction, so where we can use it? And now you can really name almost any uh, any uh, domain where we can take advantage of generative modeling by uh, starting with uh, text analysis, image analysis, uh, medical data, all the data, graph analysis, graph data, but also active learning, reinforcement learning, where we want to, to have this notion of uncertainty, we want to have this notion of, or a capability of generating new uh, data points. For instance, in active learning, we can imagine that we have an agent that uh, explores reality and it, it, it is uncertain about something. For instance, uh, it has never encountered the panda bears, but uh, uh, horses and cats were present in the past. So for instance, uh, it can ask for this, exactly this object, right? So it can ask a human manipulator, for instance, uh, to, you know, to provide more data looking like that, because this is something like I've never seen before. And, and, and in reinforcement learning, we can think of uh, an agent that actually internally in, in let's say, in the brain uh, starts generating some sequences of uh, some behavior and uh, tries to imagine uh, what could happen next. And for instance, you know, generate some sequences of, of uh, behavior and then, and then uh, can pick the next action by looking at that. This is more like also what we do as human beings actually. So we, we uh, try to imagine what may happen and then we try to pick 
is this action that is you know the best for us or most probable in some sense but these are only you know this this uh, main applications or main domains where we can apply generative modeling uh, but there are way more and uh, if we answered uh, the question where so we should answer how to how formulate uh, deep generative models right and so far th there are three groups in, of generative models autoregressive models flow based models and latent variable models and these latent variable models uh, it can be defined in this implicit manner it means that we don't say exactly what is the distribution but we are capable of generating uh, new objects or so-called prescribed models where we say this is a gaussian distribution this is a categorical distribution all right so we say uh, in advance what kind of distributions we are dealing with in this implicit uh, modeling approach we are just saying all right, we have a model. We don't know what is the distribution, but we are uh, capable of generating new objects. Here is um, an, uh, a table with uh, different criteria and how we can compare these uh, mo generative models, right? Because of course, for some reason, people came up with different uh, classes of models uh, for some reason. And here it's, of course, totally arbitrary, but I think it helps to understand uh, when and why we have different uh, generative models. So we can look at a training process, uh, how it behaves, is it stable or unstable, uh, whether we can calculate the likelihood function or not, or we need to approximate it somehow. We, of course, can look at the sampling process, whether it's fast or slow. And also we can look at the compression perspective. So what does it mean? It means uh, whether we can use this model for compression to some kind of, uh, you know, extracting the most important information from, from data, right? For instance, for sending it to, uh, to some other, I don't know, mobile phone or other machine uh, and then decoding it back, right? And if we look at other aggressive models, so they are definitely stable during training. You can, you ha we have exact likelihood function, but sampling is very slow and we, we cannot easily use it for compression or at least uh, we, we cannot, uh, you know, obtain some like extracted, uh, extracted information from data. Flow-based models, they are, uh, still use very stable during training. We have the exact likelihood function. Sampling depends, it's rather fast, but the compression is again, um, uh, not the, the, not, this model is not suited for compression purposes. Implicit models, they, they have very un unstable training. We cannot use, uh, uh, use them for calculating the likelihood function because they are implicit models, like for instance, GANs. But sampling is very fast. Uh, quality of them, uh, so quality of, uh, for instance, images is really high. Uh, they are easy to understand. Uh, but again, for compression, they are not necessarily useful. And the last class of models, it's the so-called the prescribed models, like the variational autoencoders that we will discuss today. So they are rather stable during training. We don't have the exact likelihood function, but we, we can approximate it and we can approximate it pretty well. The sampling is rather fast and quick and we can also use it for compression. So it means that we actually have this structure that uh, goes uh, from high dimensional space to low dimensional space and, and we have some, let's say, code. 